Hello and welcome back to the Final Whistle podcast. My name is Harry McBain and always, as always, I'm joined by my co-host Bobby Addison. How are you, Bobby? Hi, Harry. I'm doing great. Thank you. Now, this week we're speaking to a man who was part of the Wimbledon team that played in the Premier League and also won the FA Cup. He's also played for both Man City and Everton. It's former defender Terry Phelan. Thank you for coming on, Terry. How are you doing? I'm doing very fine, thank you very much. Thank you for having me on the show uh, tonight. Yes, all the way from India, Bangalore. So it's not too bad at all. It's nice to see uh, a chap with a Nottingham no- Forest top on, I see. Is that right? <laughs> Nottingham Forest top? Yes, definitely wow. very, uh, very proud. Good, <laughs> good. Now, you started off uh, back in the Leeds Youth Academy. Well, what made you want to become a footballer? I think it was every boy's dream, you know, when you're, you're playing on the streets, that's the only game we ever watched on TV, a black and white TV was, was football. You know, we never watched Andy Pandy or the Magic Roundabout. We, uh, we, we watched football and, you know, uh, every weekend we play for the school, you play for your local club and you try to take something off the TV or the players off the TV and, and, and emulate it out on the streets, you know, you had your teams. But back then it was probably... 15, 20 aside, you know, and it was, it was helpful ever. It was, you know, the best of the best and the fittest of the best. And if you, you know, you, we'd have little games called Wembley and Knockout. And no, it was very exciting. There was no, there was no rules, you know, whoever brought the ball always won the game kind of (laughs) thing, you know? So, so no, I mean, it was, it was exciting times growing up and that's what we had. We had a football, everybody had a football and, you know, we just played at, at the end of the streets. We played wherever we could. You know, wherever there was a little bit of a grass or a little bit of dirt or a little bit of concrete, you see everybody playing out on the street. You don't see that nowadays, obviously. Uh, mm. a, lot of, a lot of the children are playing now in confined, nice areas, you know, little five-side AstroTurf pitches, which is great. They're getting a lot of coach education out of the children, whereas we just played and uh, coached ourselves on the streets, really. Every man for himself. Well, you just mentioned there, obviously, taking stuff off the TVs. Who were your idols when you were growing up as a kid? Well, obviously, you know, I mean, I remember my first uh, FA Cup was the, I think it was the 1976, it was Southampton versus Manchester United. I wasn't a Manchester United fan, I was a Manchester City fan. I was, a, I was the only mm. Manchester City fan in my area. So that's why I was quite quick because I used to always get chased by the Manchester United fans because I had a blue, I had a Man City top, but that didn't bother me. It's nice to be different anyway. But uh, no, I think I think the great Liverpool side of the the seventies and eighties, growing up watching them, just the way they played the football, that's what attracted me. The way they played the football, the fast flowing uh, football, and then watching the, the seventy eight World Cup uh, in Argentina, watching the great Brazilian sides and the Argentinian sides. You know, I always wanted to emulate them players with the skill and the technique and playing the ball on the floor and being exciting. Uh, that's what I always wanted to do. I couldn't particularly tell you any particular player. It was just mm. the way the teams played. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And obviously, you know, as you, you must have got on in your career and you've obviously taken different experiences in and shaped them to what you are. And then... You're part of the Wimbledon team that played in the Premier League with, you know, the likes of John Fashionu, Vinnie Jones, all these sort of players that everyone has, you know, everyone's heard of. Mm. What was it like to play with people, you know, nicknamed the crazy gang? Did it sort of, you know, did it give you a good experience as a footballer playing in that team? Well, it's quite tough to tell you the truth because I, I, I'd, I'd left Leeds. I'd played in the Leeds team uh, 20 odd times and then I went to Swansea and mm-hmm. I played there for one year. And then they turn around and says, uh, you're going to Wimbledon. I just signed a new contract after that year. You're going to Wimbledon. I said, Wimbledon? I said, where's that? I said, that's a Terry Orif, an old ex-player of uh, Leeds United. I said, Wimbledon, they play tennis there. He said, no, they've got a football team in the big <laughs> league, in Division 1. And I'm like, really? Yeah. In Division 1? He said, you're going to be playing against Liverpool, your Manchester United. This is what you want. This is what you've grown up to do. You know, we're sending you there. And that was it. And I mean, the first six months was very tough because you had to buy your way in. You know, you had to buy your way into the philosophy. You had to buy your way into the family. You had to buy your way into the players. So it was very tough for me because they played a different style of football. You know, football is a simple game, but they played it in a different way. They didn't, they didn't particularly want too many passes in and around their, mm. their own defending third or the middle third. They wanted to get it forward nice and early into pockets, little triggers. 
And you had to learn that. And, and, and he ended up learning it. So the first six months was a little bit difficult because the crazy gang, they was crazy. And in the dress yeah. room, they do all sorts in the dress room. So <laughs> that was a bit of an eye opener. I'm lucky enough, nothing ever happened to me because obviously playing for Leeds United, uh, I had a little bit of a, a statement and, you know, Everybody knew that, knew that Leeds United was a big club and then playing, obviously, mm -hmm. for Swansea. But, uh, no, it was tough for the first six months. I, I won't tell you any lies there, but I, I soon settled in. I remember playing a game against Newcastle and I just said, listen, I'm taking the shackles off here and I'm just going for it. And that game, when I played that game and come into the dress room, uh, you know, after the game, all the players sort of like, come around me, threw me up in the air and it was an acceptance. You've been accepted yeah. to the family now. This is what we want. This is what we're looking for. And I never looked back. I had uh, five wonderful years at uh, Wimbledon. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, that must be definitely part down to the success of that team. It's just sort of the family aspect, isn't it? Because obviously with the big characters, like you mentioned, Vinny and all those people in the dressing room, you must have felt sort of brilliant when they sort of let you into their, you know, their family. It must have felt nice to put your effort in and you're into the team. And now they've sort of accepted you into the the family really as you said before well that's what it was all about you know they knew I had something in me because I'd played for Leeds United and I'd played for yeah. Swansea I only missed one game for Swansea played for Leeds United uh, I was an Irish uh, youth international an under 21 international mm -hmm. B team international so it wasn't as if I didn't know anything about the game uh, and it was just that acceptance it was that love and that the character of the players of the, every one of them and you know, I felt like 10 foot tall, to tell you the truth. And, mm -hmm. you know, I thought, right, yeah, I, I'm, part of, I'm part of the crazy gang now. Even though it was quite quiet, I'm part of the crazy gang. Uh, let's see if we can go forward. Let's see if we can be exciting. And we had some wonderful, exciting times. Now, mm. during your time at Wimbledon, uh, you won the FA Cup in what was considered at the time a shock win over Liverpool because of Liverpool, obviously a very big team. How did it feel to win such a prestigious trophy? Well, like I just said to you before, you know, my first, watching my first uh, FA Cup final was 1976. It was Manchester United against Southampton and Southampton won that game. Uh, <clears throat> so, I, and, you know, the old Wembley, the Twin Towers, you know, as, as a young boy back then, you always wanted to play at Wembley. And that was, that was a dream. So to be able to walk out on that field, and like I've already said before about the great Liverpool sides, watching them play against mm -hmm. Liverpool, was an absolute wonderful achievement. It was a dream come true. And dreams do come true if, if you wait for them. Uh, so for me, it was a fantastic day. And, you know, people said we were the underdogs, but we fancied ourselves and all. We, you know, we wasn't going to sit in the dressing room and say, oh, we're not going to go out today. We're going to be, uh, we're going to get absolutely hammered. We, you know, we had a bit about us and we said, look, if we do the right things and play our style of play and, and do the, the, the uh, defending uh, moments of the game, we can end mm -hmm. up nicking a goal at a set play, a set play. And, and that's what we ended up doing. You know, I go down the wing, Dennis White, I get a foul. Dennis Wise whips it in on his uh, lovely right foot and Lonnie Sanchez clips it in the, in the, the far corner over Bruce Grobler's head uh, with his little, uh, a little head, a little flick on header. So it was, it was, a, it was a fantastic day, you know, 100,000 people there playing at Wembley, meeting Princess Di. I mean, you, you, you know, you, you, you can't buy that now. Yeah. Now, do you feel the the competition of the FA Cup's kind of lost its of it, its importance of structure that many people just use it, especially in, as the top teams to field out the youth players. How now that you know domestic success is seen as more important, do you feel that it's lost its um its way in the English game? I think it did for a while because a lot of uh, managers uh, did see it as a, a real competition because it was already in maybe bigger competitions like the Champions League or going for the uh, EPL. Mm -hmm. Uh, so for, for me, you know, it's the oldest cup competition in the world and you should never lose sight of that. I think now the nostalgia's come back now, it really means something. You look at Arteta and Arsenal, what they've done, they've gone and won it. You know, you look at the Arsenal team before with Wenger, uh, uh, you know, when he was really struggling, two back-to-back -back FA Cups. You know, a trophy is mm -hmm. a trophy at the end of the day, guys. And, mm -hmm. you, you know, you play football to win trophies. You, you, your fans want you to win trophies. It's no use saying, oh, the FA Cup means nothing. Well, it's the oldest competition in the world, so it must mean something. And I want to tell you something else. The, the, the amount of world-class players who have had their hands on that trophy should mean an awful lot. Yeah. Uh, and I know it means an awful lot to the supporters because supporters, again, uh, pay the money and they want to win trophies, no matter what trophy it is. If it's a League Cup, uh, the Champions League, 
EPL or the FA Cup, they want to win trophies, even when they go abroad pre-season. Do you want to win that trophy? Because it's, in, it's installed in you as a professional footballer. But obviously, mm-hmm. managers and owners, uh, they, they, they did see it a different way, but the nostalgia's come back now to the FA Cup, mm-hmm. and it's fantastic to see it come back. Now, yeah, as I said, during your time, um, you played as a, a, you know, some very well-known stars during that era of the Premier League, Eric Cantona, Alan Shearer, and being a defender, who would you say was the hardest player you've faced or having to defend against? I would say Alan Shearer because he had an a, array of all different uh, technical skills. You know, he could, he was quick, he was strong, he was, he, he was quick off the, the first five yards, he was strong. He could drift out into wide areas, he could cross, but his finishing was absolutely fantastic. And if he, if he, pinned, if he was pinned up against you, you know, he was that strong that he could roll you. So you'd always have to give yourself mm. a couple of yards. I mean, uh, you know, you look at Alan Shearer, Ian Wright was absolutely fantastic playing against Ian Wright, quick, agile. Uh, aggressive, it could get stuck in and all. He was one, and obviously you've got people like you know you had Ed, Ed, Eric Cantona about then. You had a, a wonderful array of, of players, Mark Hughes, you know, who played at Manchester United. So you know you, you you could really go go on and on and on about the players you know who had, had ended up playing against. Yeah, and obviously you know nowadays you see those upper echelon sort of players, the higher tier. They're going for a lot of money and there's big expectation on, you know, the players that get signed for a lot of money. And maybe, you know, when in 1992, you moved to Man City, the boyhood mm. club, 2.5 million. That's mm. the club record fee. Did you mm. definitely sort of feel that sort of uh, maybe, you know, you just sort of need to play yeah. up to the price tag in a way? Cause well, it was a big you know what? It was, it, was, it was too much for a defender. They paid two and a half million for Keith Curl. Peter Reid had a blueprint. He had a plan. He had a mm-hmm. philosophy of how he wanted to go and he was building that philosophy. He was building a, a, a very good, tidy team. He wanted his back four quick and agile. He had Tony Colton behind. Uh, and I could have went to Barcelona, Ajax, Manchester United, Celtic, Rangers, uh, Tottenham Hotspurs. Uh, I think there was a couple Everton at the time. So, so back to Leeds at the time. But... Uh, Nobody was going to pay two and a half million pounds. Yeah. And at the last minute, Peter Reid came in and said, Listen, I, I'm going to pay two and a half million pounds for you. Uh, and Sam Haman says, Yeah, we're going to take that money. Obviously, Sam Haman thought I was worth that, but other mm-hmm. clubs didn't. You know, I think, oh, Bolton, Crystal Palace was going to pay it and all. Crystal Palace was going to pay two and a half million uh, back mm-hmm. then and all. So for me, it was, uh, it was just going and doing a job. There was no pressure. It was going to do the job. I knew I could handle the pressure. I knew what it was all about. I was an international football player, played on the world stage. So for me, it was just, if you could make the, the, the supporters be excited, if I could excite the supporters by my yeah. attitude and my commitment and my endeavourment and my character getting up and down that line. You know, to talk about modern day fullbacks now, well, I was doing it 30 odd, 35 years ago with no problem up and down all day long and ask anybody who, who, who would have known me or played against me. So mm-hmm. for me, it was just getting out there, being exciting for the, uh, the fans and, and getting the fans off the seats. And, you know, what, if, if they were singing your name, you knew you was doing well. Yeah. And, it, and it, it wasn't very often that they wasn't singing my name. And I don't mean to be, uh, have an ego there or not, because if you work hard in any walk of life, if you work hard, and you've got good commitment and focus and desire, uh, you, can, you can do anything you want in the world. Now, uh, as you mentioned earlier on, that City were your boyhood club and who you supported. What, how much did it mean to you to play you know, for, for the team you supported? I think it was great. I think, it's, like I said, it's every boy's wish. Uh, you know, if we go back in the interview, I said uh, my first shirt was a blue and white one, a Manchester City one. Uh, mm. I, I was brought up you know, in between England and Ireland. And uh, growing up in Salford, it was a big red area. Uh, and, and me running around in a, uh, a Manchester City shirt, well, I had to be different. So, you know, I think I had, I had a trial for Manchester City as a 12-year-old and I could have signed a four-year contract for Manchester City. But I opted to go to Leeds because Leeds was in the old second division then. And a lot of the players was getting older, so I had a better chance of getting in the first team. Uh, but it was great. It was great to go back to Manchester City. It was great to play for a club like Manchester City, and it'll always be cemented in the brickwork there that I did play for a club like Manchester. City. Uh, I think the only down point was Peter Reid getting getting the sack after my first year, 
and not winning a trophy there. We were nearly there in the quarterfinals of the FA Cup, mm. got beat off Spurs. Uh, I scored a fantastic goal. But it was just, that, that really put a real damper on it. And I said to myself, I could have went anywhere in the world to big, massive clubs. Man City is a big club, don't get me wrong. Uh, and I expected to man the manager to be there and, and, and grow the team and nurture the team of what his plan was and what his philosophy was and it didn't happen so that was a that was a real big downer for me that yeah and you know obviously as you mentioned almost getting silverware I'm lucky to lose the Spurs in that game but obviously mm. looking that goal I'm sure you you must have watched it at least how many times have you watched in a row 10 15 because it is absolutely always oh, a beautiful goal well we it's talk so... about modern we talk about modern day foot fullbacks don't we you know I was doing that I was doing that in a regular kit uh uh, occasions, maybe picking a ball up in the halfway line, going past two or three players and crossing balls in for Nal Quinn or David White or Michael Sheeran. You know, I was I was doing it week in a week out, but I think on that particular day, you know, we was doing very well in the first half. We was one nil up, we was cruising the game. I, I don't think we should have went in at half time. And then, you know, I got a little bit cheesed off. It was four, you know, four one down. I got a bit cheesed off. I said to Tony Cole, "Yeah, just roll the ball out to me, see what I can do." And <laughs> Before you know, he ended up in the uh, the middle of uh, the Spurs uh, net, and I just popped it in the corner, and that that was it. Game game over. You know, it was it was a sad day because I really did think we had a chance of uh, winning the cup that year. Now you played oh. for Everton between '97 and 2000, and during that time, you you suffered injury an injury which put you out on the sidelines for a long time, 18 months roughly, I think. Yes. What was it like yeah. not playing for that long? Well, you know, when, when, you know, when, you, when supporters turn around and say, oh, you, you, you're earning a lot of money, you should be happy, you know, you should be uh, very uh, worthy getting that type of money, but then they don't see the psychological side of it at all. You know, anybody who's playing five-a-side, the normal player out there playing five-a-side with his mates and he pulls an hamstring and he can't, he can't walk for six months, or sorry, six weeks, it's, it, you know, it hurts. Mine was a little cartilage, I kept coming back, coming back too early, then... I'd have a calf injury because, you know, uh, imbalance was in there. Me, me imbalance was in there. And I just couldn't get back. And it was 18 months. It was 18 long months of being in the gym. But I never gave up. You know, I could have give up. Took me insurance money and said no. But I wasn't going to give up. I was a fighter. I stayed in the gym morning, noon and uh, night. And I worked myself back. And I went to Crystal Palace on loan. And I played some of the best football I'd ever played under Steve Coppola at Crystal Palace. Some wonderful mm -hmm. football. Uh, so for me, I was back on the stage again. It, it was just time. It was just getting the confidence and building your confidence up in yourself to be able to go out there and think, am I going to get injured? Am I going to pull an hamstring? Am I going to pull a groin? Because I don't think the sports science and the medical was as good back then as it is now. Uh, and it was only a cartilage injury, so I should have been back in you know, three, three, three weeks. But it was tough, tough mentally. But uh, I'm a tough-minded character anyway. My character got me through it, you know. Uh, I, I used it as a challenge. I used it as a real challenge. And I ended up getting back in the Irish national side and all. And then joining, obviously, I joined Fulham and I'm playing there for a couple of years. So that was good. And winning, obviously, the, uh, the championship there. Yeah, and I think a lot of what you mentioned, you know, in your career, your your style of play. It's also a lot about passion and desire and, you know, doing mm. as best as you can. And also you yeah. must have felt a lot with that. Maybe when you represented your country, I mean, 42 times playing in the World Cup must be a great honour. And you obviously wanted to, you know, do as best as you can in your club, no matter what the situation, just in order to have that opportunity to play for your country because it is a big incentive for a lot of people. Listen, uh, guys, you know, when you grow up being a football player, for me, it was about work. It was about putting food on the table. Mm. you know, and working hard. It's, it's, it's as simple as that, you know, and yeah, we, we, we could go off the cuff. Yeah, we could go, go out, uh, all the boys would go out together. Yes, we did have arguments with, with managers because we were just so passionate. We were just so passionate back then that we wanted to play every game. There was no rotation policies then. You know, you had one sub, two subs. You know, it was get out there and play. If you had to play 50, 60 games, you played 50 or 60 games. You got on with mm. it, you know, we was fit enough to be able to do that. Uh, so, you know, obviously uh, playing for Ireland was, was a fantastic achievement. Obviously, you always want to play for your country as a, a young boy or a young girl, you know, now. And uh, that's the pinnacle, isn't it? That's the pinnacle of your career, playing for your country. Playing 40-odd times for Ireland and playing in the World Cup. 
like I said again earlier on, my first, first World Cup I watched was the 1978 World Cup when Argentina won it. Uh, Ozzy Ardias and Ricky Villa and, and Mario Kempes when they, when they won it. So it was a dream again to go and play in the World Cup. And you, you know, when you play in the World Cup as a, as a, a top player, it's, it's the pinnacle. It's the pinnacle. And, you know, mm. I can obviously say I've done that. Yeah. Mm. I mean, obviously, the, work, the game is definitely sort of changing a lot as we go through the years. We're seeing new rules, new systems coming in. And I was wondering maybe if you give us an opinion. Obviously, in the Premier League, it just kicked off. There's a lot of controversy going around about VAR, handballs, you know, making different decisions. Mm. What do you think your mm. sort of standpoint is on it? Do you think it's a good thing or maybe sort of... Well, to... well it, it, it's 50-50, isn't it? You know, it can go either way. Can't it? it can go against you yeah. or go for you. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day... They make the rules. We don't make the rules. But I think what 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 uh, it's got to be out there. This handball situation. Where do mm-hmm. you put your hands if you're a defender? You know where do you put them? You know there was one the other day where the, the ball flicked up. I think it, I think it was in Serie A or something yeah. like the ball flicked up. The, the ball flicked up off a heel and it hit an hand and it was handball. You know I I, I mean I don't know how that is possible. If if no. if, if if you're defending and uh, a winger or a, a centre forward smashes mm. the ball at you from ten, you know, five yards away or two yards away <laughs> and it hits your arm, how are you supposed to get out of the way? But yeah, they say no. now, if your arm's outstretched, if you flex it, 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 it's a penalty. But what are you supposed to do now? How are you supposed to get out of the way? Put your mm. arms behind your back. If you turn and it hits your arm, then, you know, it's a penalty this day and age. I don't like the offside rule. I don't like the offside rule. You know, I think no. they should blow up. Str- I think they should blow up straight away. They shouldn't let the game develop and then blow up because then what happens? Then how does the referee and the linesman know where it, it started off? Mm. Yeah. If, they, if they play on and then they see it and then they wave the flag and then they have to go all the way back again, so it's time wasting. I don't, I don't like that. Blow up straight away. If the fellow's offside, he's offside and blow up and stop it. Get the ball there and get the ball playing again. They let it develop and then they stop the game and bring in the game back again. Yeah, you know? it's just wasting time, mm. isn't it? It's just, it's just wasting time. It's just, it's just, it's just a stupid rule. Now, a you're f- offside, uh, you're offside. Yeah. Now, a few, uh, two little easier questions here. Now, this one's uh, I've taken away from a radio show, so I'm just going to put that out here now. now if you could host uh, a dinner and invite, um, say, let's say three footballing-related people, they can be alive or they can be dead, who would you invite... You know, just to experience an evening with. Uh, I'd have I'd have Roy Keane there because he'd be fun. Ooh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'd have I'd have I'd have Roy Keane there. Uh, who else would he have? Oof, I'd, I've got to have I've got to have Ronaldo there, Cristiano Ronaldo. Oh. I, I'd have Ronaldo there. Uh, yeah, I've got to have Ronaldo there. And who else would I have? I think I'd have I think I'd have Slatten because Slatten's a bit of a character, isn't he? That's a good point. Yeah, mm-hmm. that would be interesting yeah. to talk to him. I, I, I think I'd have Slatten. Yeah, I, I think that's a, I think that's a good group. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that's a good group. Yeah. Well, I think that's a nice. That, got that's a that's a nice group. There. That. Yeah. Oh, you got you got three characters. That you got, uh, you know, Slatten. You know, I did Serie A uh, last night for uh, Sony Sports India, and you know, for a man of thirty nine years of age. It's just absolutely fantastic. And, you know, he's, he's putting the gold nut down to Ronaldo and Messi to see if they can do it at 39 years of age, yeah. maybe 40 years of age. So he's putting the gold nut down to them. He's saying, hey, guys, 39-year-old can do it. What are you going to be doing at 39? So I think I'd love to sit around the table with him. Obviously, Ronaldo and uh, uh, Roy Keane, because Roy Keane would know Ronaldo anyway, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he would know Slatten being at Manchester United. So... I shouldn't really say this. Should I be in a City fan? They're three <laughs> Manchester United players. <laughs> yeah, you're getting caught out there. Yeah, I'm getting caught out there. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, well, well, we can end it with a slightly easier one, you know, maybe a bit of a generic question. But if you right. had to give up-and-coming footballers one piece of advice, what would you say is your, your go-to, your most important thing, just as an aspiring footballer, really? Have the right attitude of mind. Yeah. Just have okay. the right attitude of mind. Simple. If you've got the right attitude of mind, you can go on and be a football player. You don't have to be a follower. You, 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 you don't have to do it. You don't have to be a sheep. You can be different. And those players who are different, the ones who make it. Definitely, they're the ones who make it, uh, to tell you the truth. But a good attitude of mind. That's what I was told. I was travelling on a bus to a game for school 
and the school teacher called to me and went, Terry, one thing about you, you've got a great attitude of mind and a good appetite for the game, whether it's training, whether it's raining, whether it's snowing, you've got a real good appetite for the game and you love the game. And I think you've got to love the game. You've got to not look at the money. The money will come to you, mm. you know, if you, just, if you just play and you give your all and you're, you're ready to accept uh, everything that's going to come to you, then you, you can do anything you want. I mean, I've just told you some fantastic stories about me. 18 months out injured. Uh, who, who would have ever thought I would have played for me country Republic of Ireland again? Mm. Just shows you, got to have a good attitude of mind. Strength of, strength of body, strength of mind. That's all it is. 100%. Well, that is all we have time for this week. Thank you, Terry, for coming on and for Thank sharing uh, stories about your career with us. It's been great talking to you. Thank you very much. Cheers, boys. Lovely. Keep, keep the good work going up. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you very much. And thank, and thank you everyone for listening. Don't forget to share with your friends. It's goodbye from me. And it's a goodbye from me as well. Thank you for listening. That was the final whistle.